So uh, now that we're all friends, um, <laughs> let the games begin. And let me uh, again, do, if just in case not everybody has the link to the doc. Um, ah, rules. So in the doc, you'll find a doc. You'll find a document. Uh, you'll find an image on like the third or fourth page that has this sort of growth ladder for the liberating structures development phases. Um, if I would like to invite you to add your development phase after your name in Zoom, just so that we can get some sense of where everybody's familiarity is. And there are some cool uh, additional roles that we can use to activate. So like I will go Jeremy Akers minimalist. If I can remember how to spell minimalist. Man. Minimalist, there we go. And did anybody have any structures that came up in their conversations that they hope we might get to and unpack as we go along today? Uh, as I give you guys multiple uh, uh, invitations at once, change your name and answer my question. Well, for me, it's difficult because I've only used a few and it's a long time ago. Um, so anything that is brought up today is good for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the, the long and short of why we want to be explicit about our development phase is that uh, I have also some specific invitations to help each person at their appropriate phase take up some specific membership roles. So for those of us that are still despairing cynics and, and super new to liberating structures, I would invite you to use that relative, uh, that noob status to help us challenge our assumptions and ask us hard questions about why would that work and to uh, <laughs> won't stay to the end. <laughs> Thank you, Dove. I like yeah, I like your transparency. Um, so you know, help hey, if you're super new. Just help us, you know, challenge yeah. our assumptions and our orthodoxy, because otherwise we'll get stuck into groupthink. If you're a cautious optimist, then you know, ask for clarification and explanation. Don't let us off the hook with, by being presumptive and ask that we unpack uh, all of the things that we, the tools and methods so that we can make sure that we are raising everybody's ship. Um, I mixed metaphors, but I think you get it. Um, super users, you know, uh, especially answer questions you haven't answered before and yeah, and even if it's a little on the edge, even if you're not sure, it's going to stick. You know, we're pretty warm room. Uh, we're all friends here. So try and uh, offer what insight you have. And for the middle of us in the room, try and shut up. Um, I'm speaking to myself. Um, make space for other people to answer questions, even though I'm sure you've got an answer on the tip of your tongue, Jeremy, and then build on the input of others. So if we all take up one of these membership roles, uh, or all of them, then we should have a super awesome great time. And that's basically that. So I think the doc will sort of start in earnest with uh, the wise crowds image, which is going to be our structure for today. Uh, does anybody else want to unpack and walk us through the, the structure of wise crowds? All right, then I'll do it and I'll jump in. So Wise Crowds runs very similar to the pattern that is Troika. 
So one place person will take on the role of client and they will bring us their uh, design brief, their help request. And they'll have a couple minutes to explain a little bit about their situation. And then the rest of us will take on the role of consultant. And the consultants after hearing the help request will then have some time to ask clarifying questions, uh, but are gonna hold off on giving any advice or, you know, uh, or the, con the consultation will wait until after the clarifying questions have been answered. After that, the client is gonna mute themselves and turn off their webcam and us consultants are then gonna offer our advice or insight or um, information um, amongst each other. And we're also gonna make use of this document and the design so storyboard, which you'll find underneath it. So our goal is to come up with a string of structures that they could use to address their, design, their help request. And after we sort of uh, spar with each other and come up with a, a prototype of a game plan that they might be able to use, the client will come back into the call, turning on their webcam and microphone, and they'll say, oh, awesome guys, I love that so much. Um, this is, this is going to change my, my day. Um, or they're going to say, ooh, I realized I, answered, I asked for the wrong type, the wrong help, because that is not useful to me whatsoever or something somewhere in between, perhaps maybe both. Um, and then if we have time, we'll move on to another help request and repeat the whole thing again, all over again. So does anybody have questions about the basic nuts and bolts? Righteous. Um, with repetition, um, that one's really getting in there. Um, so then the question is, does anybody have a uh, help request? A design brief for us to work on? I tried to submit one through the form on the registration and it was, it was disappeared into the April. <laughs> oh God, oh, so, that's painful. So I, I can I can give you one and you can you know accept or reject I don't mind. I'm just... trying. I'm working in an international education charity, and I have a bunch of different sites. And I do data and analytics and strategy. So I'm thinking about evidence based decision making, problem solving 101 type of stuff. And I'm about to relaunch a data platform, a Tableau based data platform and a series of data conversations following on to a ransomware attack that took out the um, took out technical capabilities of the IT infrastructure. So everything's being restored. The system's coming back up. It's a chance to refresh a sort of two-year development effort that went before that. And I want to build community so I'm, I'm looking to come up with a standard set of data conversations or meetings that I can have with educators, students, staff and administrators, and possibly parents. And I'm thinking about how to invite people in my community to join in designing that series of events. And some of my challenges and obstacles include the fact that the system has been off for six months. So people have either forgotten it or thought to themselves, this is another one of those initiatives that comes and goes. I was resisting it before. I didn't have to resist it for six months, but I might just resist through the next phase as well. Another challenge is just making sure that people have time in their schedules to actually learn something new and work with their colleagues to discover insight as opposed to being defensive. And it's probably my number one obstacle is people being defensive because they think that the use of evidence in education is all about judging whether or not they are good or bad. So I'm trying to convey the message that it's not about good or bad. It's about useful, not useful, uh, efficacy or not efficacy. So, and I think that probably, that probably gives you an idea of how things work. Or don't. I'm typing furiously, multitasking. So let me run through the basics. So 
the place or the context, it sounds like is in the development environment um, of this product that had previously went, went through a sort of service outage, or, right? Um, and the, the goal of this session sounds, it sounds, it rhymes a little bit like root cause analysis to me. Um, you you wanna do some bit of exploration about what, what happened with the, the outage and maybe learn some lessons. Not, not so interested in what happened with the outage, more interested in building a culture of continuous improvement and learning going forward. So I had an effort that was going that was interrupted by the outage. So the outage is uh, not something that is, you know, it's not common in the community to know anything about that. It's a lot of teachers who will use the system to say, the things that I'm doing in my class are working. My kids are advancing or you know they're satisfied we have like various sources of data about the perspective and part of the challenge is to take ones and zeros and mix them with things like more qualitative data like satisfaction surveys happiness you've got standardized assessments that people do because they're you know in fourth grade or 12th grade or they're taking ib or they're taking ap so there's a lot of numeric and quantitative data there's a lot of qualitative data and historically, there hasn't been a lot of collaboration or cooperation across roles. It's a very siloed environment. So it's it's less about the failure than it is about growing something new, really. So that sounds like there's a lot of information. A lot of people have different sources of information. You'd like to sort of mix those up. How do we make use of that stuff? And that's would and uh, when I think about the the purpose or outcome, like building this culture of continuous learning, seems to be that's that's where we're trying to go. And the participants, can you tell me a little bit more about this the diversity of stakeholders as I fix the sound of Ninjago for my son? Yeah, I, I would break it down into the people that are professional educators, so they're trained as teachers and they're working leading classes. And then there's staff and support people that are doing learning support or um, athletics or things that are good for whole child development as opposed to just academic learning. And then there are the staff and administrators who you know make things work and make sure that the heat is on and we're accredited by the appropriate bodies and to handle relationships with the parents. And then there are the parents who have their own ability to support the community and the organization and also their own interests you know the their needs and it's a international environment so probably about 75 countries and around 50 languages something like that so does that give you a better idea that gives me the basic nuts and bolts and then I mean, my fellow consultants, what clarifying questions might we have about uh, David's situation? So, so me, um, it, your description is too dense for me, frankly. So I have two questions. That, like hearing you, it sounds like you have it all figured out. What would you like to happen? What sort of help would you like? I would like to invite people to join in the effort and I would not like to make them think that it's all figured out or too dense to solve so those are two sides of the same thing how could I how could I have a, a an objective that's clear enough to invite people to create that sense of collaboration and working together as opposed to staying in silos Or let's say, how can we invent a new normal rather than trying to go back to the old normal? Who is we? Our community. Okay, and, and another thing that I don't understand, what you describe is the problem of whom? And my follow-up question will be, do they know that it's their problem? Um, the problem right now is that we've lost we've lost two years of opportunity and i think people are exhausted so the problem is exhaustion the failure of it 
is a transitory thing because now IT is back and it's successful again. So it's the energy level of the community that is that has suffered. And you know, you can measure that by learning by lost learning. So achievement is going down, growth is going down. So the numbers are telling you that there is an issue, but you don't want the issue to be about the worth of the individuals. You want it to be about where are we really, honestly, where are we starting? But and again, I really don't understand the context. So when you say community, it's a voluntary community. It's a community Look, of people it, who choose it, to be there. It's it's four schools. Each school comprised of twelve years of learning. So from kindergartners, from four or five year olds up till seventeen or eighteen year olds, and the four schools are located in different locations. Okay. And your challenge is how do I bring them back? How do we bring back the energy level that drives curiosity and learning as opposed to just trying to get back to the habits that we had before the pandemic? Okay. And if you would ask them, what would they say? Some of them would say, let's just get back to normal. Some of them would say, this sounds interesting and exciting. And I think the challenge that I'm bringing to the group is how might I invite people in such a way that they come with an open mind and an open answer, as opposed to this is, I already have too much to do. Why are you asking me to invent something that is, that's, that's the job of a school. You're supposed to tell us what to do. Okay. Anyone else? How much time might you have to host this conversation? That's an interesting question, which is it a one conversation? I think of it as a series of encounters. And I use liberating structures a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic to introduce people to the idea that this might last years, not just months. And it was, it was very useful in calming the initial panic, but it wasn't um it did not continue as a regular series and as a result we've got more isolation than we had before so i, I think you know i would like to have the community say it needs to be an ongoing thing as opposed to a single conversation but i can't prescribe the outcome i i can say what i hope we will agree is that we would like the principle of continuous learning and a strong community connected group of people working on similar objectives at the level of principle as opposed to habit or recipe or directions, you know, concrete instructions type of thing. Cool. So we're on the opening salvo. Does anybody else have clarifying questions about the, the nature of David's case? And once, twice. So lost in the whole world. <laughs> I, I don't know if I've got anything from that. I'm afraid that's. Yeah. Well, I think I think there's the that then there must by definition be enough. Right? <laughs> if there's enough to get confused, <laughs> then we must have we must have more than enough. All right. Well, thanks, David. Well, let's get to we'll get to work. Put yourself on mute and turn off the mm -hmm. webcam. We'll do some magic. I'm the most curious and about this one <laughs> hang on a second i'm trying all right you still here <laughs> now why is it not i can mute you i can't Drop see the bar. i can't we're muted now david, david is muted <laughs> can't yeah. see the bottom and i think jeremy that you can also turn off his, his camera is not video moment. Oh, there we go. Oh, there you ah, go. I have the power. <laughs> so don't worry about how he it doesn't know whether how to turn it on again. But... <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. All right. So <laughs> we've got a lot of information, obviously, and it sounds like it's a quite quite a big project that he's sort of brought into this space. So I think that might be why we're swimming. Just off of the top, right? When you think about this sort of Leviathan that he's brought in. What are some structures that come to your mind that might help us 
at least do the initial like setting the stage to have this longer conversation that he brings in. Are there any structures you think might be suitable for that? So I was thinking about the 20% solution, something like that. The 15% solution? Yeah. Even I would say 5% solution. If we I'm, can. I'm not really sure whether I, um, the problem David perceives is also perceived by, perceived yeah. by his surrounding. So I'm a bit skittish on looking for a solution at this moment. Hmm. That's all right. There's a difference. So what structure might you might you want to, to use? Well, the one that comes to mind, I don't really know whether that's a good one. Is something like eco-cycle planning where you think out of what's the future, what's our where are we going with whatever we're doing? looking at the happy children that leave the school as being the product in your eco cycle. Okay, cool. I can dig it. So let's see if I can. If you can't, I'll, have a, I'll grab a shovel for you. <laughs> let's see if somebody could put, um, I'm sure I've got a, an image of the eco cycle here on my iPad, but if I've got one on my laptop that I can. Oh, wait a minute. The doc is on the, sh it's a shared doc. I can put it here. Cool. So EcoCycle comes up, 15% solutions. Anything else? Mm -hmm. a, a, a solution for what? So wh what are we searching structures for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about start uh, the what I get from David's uh, initial introduction is that he's trying to start a conversation really about culture change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that might be part of the to perhaps rationalize and normalize the sense of like, ah, there's so much going on. Where what are we doing here? Like he, he has brought us a very large um, actually quite massive assignment in this in this help request. So if I think about sort of undergoing this this rather long journey of changing the culture around continuous improvement and trading insight and information in this education context with different people in different locations, in different silos of different roles, um, and obviously different grades, right? So like there's an infinite number of different ways that I can see information to get stratified and lost um, sort of in between the cracks. So in this context, how, how might we make the first salvo to change the culture? I, I'll, I'll take my role as a cynic. I think that what you're doing is trying to solution too soon. What I would invite him to do before all of this is to reconsider the problem, whose problem it is, is what he's trying to do really suitable for the situation? Does he have any partners? Who is this ecosystem that he's talking about? I agree. And, right? I agree. Yeah. So, so it, I, I realize this is a meetup of uh, liberating structures, so we have to put liberating structures in the mix. But first, sit with yourself and Def define well enough the MVP, who is it used for, who are your users, and validate with your users that, that, that they need what you think they need. No. Because, not only this, because it was defined in the beginning of the pandemic, and since then there was a lot of change going on. Yeah. And what is a, and what might be a structure that he could use to do that in a participatory fashion? So one that pops up in specifically in response to what you're describing, Dove, is so there was one that that jumped out for me initially, and I'll park that. But just based on what your description, a structure that might be very useful to guide that discussion could be discovery action dialogue. So the discovery action dialogue, um, the challenge I would see with that 
Well, let me describe it first. Discovery action dialogue splits people, splits a larger group into smaller subgroups as most liberating structures do. In this instance, say groups of four or five people. It asks somebody to play the role of host and offers about seven different questions uh, to guide the conversation. And those questions tend to be around, hey, you know, um, geez, I'm looking at the actual cards, but I rarely use this. I, I do that. Again. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I, um, I don't know the questions off the top of my head. So how do you know the problem is present? Um, what do you do personally to so resolve it? And I also like to contribute to whatever the problem is. Um, who do you know that is actually really good at solving uh, whatever our problem state is? And what are some things that they do that we might be able to all learn from and exact? Um, who might need to be involved in the solution? So, I mean, the discovery action dialogue is, is a really, there we go, found it. It's a good pattern to really go about like understanding what information already exists to solve problem states uh, in the environment. And it, it asks somebody to play the role of host and it asks someone else to play the role of scribe to capture this discussion that basically can either happen in this very linear follow questions one through seven or in a much more organic sort of emergent way as the host just goes, all right, so it looks like we've sort of answered this question. The, we've looked sort of answered that question. And again, the scribe ca uh, can, uh, captures. Mm. So that was my Dove. You got? Did you find the card? No, not at all. But I have the French version, so it's really hard to find. <laughs> oh, added complexity. Um, so ah, awesome. Thanks, Ian, for dropping that one in the chat. So the the questions are: How do you know when the problem is present? How do you contribute to the solution? What prevents you to do this at all time? Do you know anyone who has solved this? Do you have any ideas? What needs to be done? Any volunteers? Who else needs to be involved? So, I mean, especially from a very like grassroots. Okay. Okay, Elena film, yeah. Hold on. So that that could be an interesting pattern to, to host this sort of broader discussion of like, hey, you know, what the f, and maybe test my hypothesis. Another pattern that I think is also could be very relevant, especially for this more. Um, yeah. For this, this checksum could also be something along the lines of conversation cafe. That one also jumps out to me. Are there are there any other patterns that when we're talking about sort of hey. checking our assumptions and what is on? So well, checking our assumptions. This has got real interest, uh, real, real multitasky, real fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, how might we be able to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe I should just shut up. Uh, let me try that. Talk about this. Yeah, let's just wondering. Is um, David the only person who's really feeling an urge to make big changes, or are there other people involved as well? What do they feel are the issues that need to be addressed? And then there was, um, yeah, this 2510 crowdsourcing. It's one of the very few that I know of and have seen videos of in action, where you have the different people going around sharing ideas and voting up ideas in a few rounds to see what is the most pressing ideas or most pressing problems for people. So could that be a way of trying to find out what else other people are interested in and what they would need from any uh, changes to his system? Or... That was Dove's favorite liberating structure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. because it, it, it's great. Uh, one thought that I had is, is not a, it's a, it's not a question, but it is a thought. Um, from my experience, the more responsibility you take on something, the less the people you work with will. 
And it seems that he takes a lot of responsibility, which doesn't, so it doesn't surprise me that the others have a, a little enthusiasm. If, from what I understood. So that's uh, one point for, you know, food for thought. Yeah. Are we uh, okay? Uh, Jeremy, wh wh when does the time end? Um, when I say so. No. Okay, good, good enough. No, I mean, so it sounds like we've got uh, this sort of question that is sort of looming large for for this group right now, which is sort of, you know, how do we know that a sort of problem is actual actually present and recognized, especially for the participants. Um, And how might we be able to sort of really lean into this space of like amplifying their their agency and their um, their responsibility to address that? And there's a laundry list of different structures that we've already sort of got on the table. So if we think about this as let's just let's just say validation is our first goal in order to do anything like check and see if we can validate that people recognize their problem and see if they're see who is sort of willing to raise their hand to 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 do something about it or you know if people to find the subgroup that says ah go fuck off you know we've got this everything's fine leave me alone um so of the laundry list of structures so uh 15 solution i notice so we didn't, we didn't unpack a couple of these things. So I'd like to just make sure that we're all sort of in a, a shared understanding space. Um, uh, Dov, could you unpack 15% solutions for those of us who may be still in this newbie state? From what I remember, uh, it's the question, what do we have to do to solve 15% of the problem? Boom shakalakalaka. So to sort of break us out of this grand architecture type thinking for a huge solution and start thinking about, you know, what's a, what's a baby step? You know, what, what is within my authority and within my power, you know, in, with no extra resources or no extra time right here and now. So in the metaphor I love for 15% solutions is like, have you ever, um, have you ever known anybody who is like really poor and still was like an amazing cook like there's just bare cupboards and somehow puts together a feast of stone soup. Like that's, that's the type of thinking I want to activate with 15% solutions. Um, eco cycle plan, panel, uh, planning is a bit of a big one. Does anybody want to jump in and unpack it for us? All right. And um, so um, eco cycle planning, um, there, so there's the eco cycle. Let's just start there, you know, uh, gestation or renewal, uh, birth and maturity and death uh, or creative destruction, call it what you want. Um, you know, the circle of life, but put into this format of the, the, the lemniscat, the infinity. So a continuous cycle that just goes over and over and over again. Um, what we would invite people to do is say, take a look at all of the things that, you know, that happen in the, the learning journey of a child, for example, and make a laundry list of all of the things. What do kids do or what do we do with kids? Just make a look of all of the things and then plot them where you think they go on the eco cycle. And thinking about that could that way of thinking about, ah, so this is an activity, is this activity actually, you know, is it creating value? Um, oh, share screen or allow yeah, us. Yeah, well, when you talk audiovisual, why not? 
Oh, yeah. I tried to share my screen, but you, you, you're the only one who's allowed. I, I am the only God here. Um, that's, how do I, I can give you co-host rights. I'm down with that. So I notice I always get so overwhelmed. Make co-host, boom. Boom, you're in there. Dove, you should be good to share it. Yeah, just while you're speaking, this is much easier, no? Ah, super. That's radical. Thanks so much. So yeah, so renewal is this stage of starting off new ideas. Um, the, it, these new ideas obviously need a lot more effort to become anything viable, and that's. Uh, but at some point, you put them time and energy, and they move into birth. Uh, they still need more time, uh, more time and energy, more effort. Um, to actually produce value. And, and that is that phase of maturity, right? You know, think of your crop at har harvest. We've sweat, we've toiled all summer long, and now we have, it is bearing fruit. And then at the end of the, your, your growing season, you have a, a moment of creative destruction, you know, when you're literally, you know, um, mowing down your fields to harvest your grain, so to speak. And uh, and planting your fallow or your cover crops. And there are these traps on the extremes though that you'll notice that when new ideas in renewal um, don't have the energy or the time invested in them, they fall into that poverty trap. You know, oh, I got this great idea. It could change the world, make me rich, solve cancer, you know, end world hunger, create world peace, but I don't put any time and energy into it. It's stuck in a poverty trap. I don't have the resources it needs. And on the flip side, there are rigidity traps. So there are some ideas, there are some initiatives, there are some things that we do that are actually valuable. They are creating value, but we get sort of stuck within that value that is created. And even though new things might be able to do the job better. So these are sort of the golden handcuffs that exist in, our, in the world that, hey, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, but, you know, what if we did break it? What if we just threw it under the bus and smashed it all up and created space for new ideas and, and new energy to fill up that space? Um, um, a, a small tangent example, I think this was the big problem of the global financial crisis in 2008, is that none of these very few financial institutions died. And so we now have these zombie financial institutions sort of roaming the earth on state support and federal, uh, federal reserve backing. Uh, whereas if they would have died, sure, we may have had a big uh, bout of chaos, um, but uh, we would also create space for something new and uh, innovative perhaps to show up in their space. So the, by plotting activities on this eco cycle, it can help us recognize, hey, what are some ideas that are maybe in there or some new in initiatives or some stuff that's happening that's stuck in the poverty trap? And what's some stuff that's happening that might be stuck or gunked up in these rigidity traps? Thanks for hanging out, Dove. See you around. Um, so by and large, it's just a really interesting way to sort of spread your thoughts out over in this very living manner and think about how we can get some more flow and motion in this space. Um, and it, it could be very interesting space to start. Um, discovery action dialogue, as I think about it, might be challenging because um, yeah, because we might be in a, a, especially a nascent space, but um, I'm not sure. But first, to unpack a Conversation Cafe, uh, Niels, can you share with us what you know about Conversation Cafe? So I put you on the spot. Yeah, you did. But I did that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know I did that. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Conversation Cafe is, um, uh, well, the way I use it is usually based on the question. So, for instance, um, uh, what's the best way to solve my problem or uh, stuff like that? 
and you just um, uh, uh, pose your question uh, and uh, break up the group in breakout rooms of four or five-ish. They um, take like five minutes to introduce themselves. Then each person takes one minute to um, uh, uh, explain their thoughts on it. Usually you use something like a talking stick to, to guide the one person that there's only one person speaking during that minute. Um, then there, uh, each person gets another uh, one minute after that to respond to everything they've heard. Then you have an open discussion of about 20-ish minutes. And you stop the breakout room. Oh, wait. Um, at the end of the breakout room, everyone takes one minute to explain what they um, what they are taking home from the session. And uh, then you stop the breakout rooms and you have a small conversation on how did it go and does anyone want to share so that you can end it as a group as well. That's it. Word. Let's throw a question into the zoo, into the group, work the circles, have an open-ended discussion, and uh, see what everybody wants to take home. Uh, yeah, that tracks. Um, so that's a that's a pattern that I think is especially useful for squishy spaces. I could also see something like um, in this instance a a a repetition of conversation cafes. Um, Nora Bateson does something called the Warm Data Lab, which is which is much more in, unstructured, but a, a sort of world cafe could, all, could also be very interesting, where you throw people into these conversation cafes to just sort of discuss, hey, now that you know maybe the world is coming back more or less to normal, where are we at now? What's, what's alive for you? And just sort of mixing up and hearing stories from multiple people's perspective, and then going to share your own stories and share their stories with other people and hear more could be really uh, fertile. Um, and last but not least in the structures that we haven't ha discussed explicitly is 2510's crowdsourcing. Um, and who, who, who talked about 2510? I think of me as well. It's um, you, you give everyone a card and you let them write the idea on one side of the card. And then they take a minute to exchange cards so they get a random one. And they read the idea that's been written on the card and rate it on the back side from zero to five. And um, then they started changing again and rating it again. And you do that around like four or five-ish times. Um, depends a bit also on how many people are there and um, what the energy in the room is. And um, then uh, you, uh, everyone has this random card with a rating, a set of ratings on the, on the back. So you um, let everyone stand in a line with the person with the highest uh, value, highest sum value, so the highest rated one at one end and the lowest at the other end. And uh, you just take the five or three ideas from the high end and you use them to solve your problem. Word. And what I love about it so much is that it is by far and away the most elegant form of collective decision making I've ever seen because at the same time everybody in the room is responsible for having made that choice um, while no one in the room is actually is also responsible for having made that choice it's just well you know this is what we can't sort of came up with together um, so both cover and anonymity and and yet decisiveness because it's, it's numbers it's math people 
as, as we describe this one, I think this could be a real good starting space just to have people, you know, describe their, their current view of the situation. And then, you know, to what extent do I agree with the view of the situation that's been handed to me could very quickly allow us to sort of upregulate, ah, these are the views that are the most widely recognized across everybody in the room. So that could instantly ground us in, this is what we decide, this is what we, uh, we know to be true. And it's a very fast structure. Um, David Heath um, from the London Liberating Structures user group designed an app, I was mentioning to somebody that can also make this happen online, which I can find a link for. So if we could instantly, rapidly crush it in this goal of this is what we know to be true, what, what, what might be the next follow-up to that um, in this list of structures that we've offered? Hmm. Um, so based on 2510, you have this set of solutions or set of problems, right? Well, uh, we could. I think in this instance, since we have, since we have, we may have a plurality of people. What we may have is, say, three statements that are widely agreed upon about the nature of the current con setting. Right. So let's just say that we 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 went with that, and that you know we we created a quick temperature check of hey. We, we many people in this room recognize that this is true and this is true and this is true. This is how I see it. This is how they, this person sees it. And this is how this person sees it. And these are broad, broadly held perspectives. If we had that as a grounding to work from of, hey, this is what we think is true. On one hand, I go, well, it's really hard to plan for that conversation because it kind of depends on what we what what is believed to be true about the present reality like if it, if if out at, if as a result of this you know the perspective that is most widely held is everything is awesome then you know something like something very problemy focused wouldn't really do a, do the trick so maybe as a result of that eco cycle could be a particularly interesting space to sort of a sort of agnostic, hey, if you think things are business as usual is cool, if you think a radical redesign needs to happen, let's still get all of the activities that are sort of ongoing in this ecosystem. And let's take a look at just, you know, sort of map them out on this eco cycle. But any other ideas? I'm not entirely sure, but because there are all these different roles and um, maybe what I need from you. Mm. I don't know, that's something that if we've got three main things to work on, but they're all going to be different roles or different, you know, the teachers, the administrators, the parents, the support group, and then maybe discuss for these points what they need from each other. That's why I thought of this one. Hmm, that could be really, that could really track, right? Uh, regardless, of, especially regardless of what the, the evaluation of the current, uh, current weather report is, like, I'm sure, I'm sure, like, I as administrator will need something from you, educator, yeah. right? Hmm. Cool. Um, so what I need from you um, is, uh, Madeline, could you maybe, do you want to unpack that one for us? <laughs> well, that would only mean I'm reading from the screen. <laughs> That's great. That, then we know for sure you'll stick the landing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, well, oh, that's difficult. There are a number of participants from different functions, different disciplines. So that's what also what he mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to find a way for them to get into conversation with each other and um, yeah. So um, So maybe if you just start with the sequence of steps. Okay, that's explaining the process. Um, the request must be clear and specific. Um, they should be able to answer. Oh, I think I've even done this maybe once. Um, the answer should be able to on, be answered with yes, no, or I will try, and whatever. Um, the requests they what I need from you is and then oh I'm not saying it right am I no that's all right let me help you out yeah um, so what I need from you um it's very okay. interesting to use this one as a very practical tool so let's just make this this division that David brought in for us of three different parties, right? Educators, support staff, and administrators, right? So in these three different subgroups, the educators would gather with the educators and the support staff with the support staff and the administrators with the administrators. And they would gather together to come up with two specific requests for each of the other three groups. So educators would say, hmm, you know, what we need, what we really need from support staff is this and this. What we really need from administrators is this and this. And like Madeline was saying, these requests should be formulated as simple thumbs up, thumbs down. Like, I want, I want cookies. May I have cookies from you, right? You can simply say yes to that or no to that. Yeah. Um, and then we come together after we have been apart, we come together and we say, hey, so, all right, these are our requests of you guys and these are, and you, you trade requests. And then the emissaries, uh, so not the entire group, that would seem like a gang war for you know, bringing the entire mobs together, uh, but emissaries from each of these subgroups come together, trade yeah. requests, and then go back to their subgroup and go, hey, this is what everybody else asked of us. What do we think about that? Administrators want, uh, or support staff wants these two things from us, and administrators want these two things with us. One of we want to respond in one of four ways. We want to say yes, thumbs up, we've got that, you can get it. Thumbs down, boo, no, not going to happen. Um, we'll try, mm, or whatever. And whatever is really a, I don't really know what you mean when you ask me for this. Like it just doesn't have enough body or concreteness. It's a little too fuzzy for me to even say yes or no, or I'll try to. And what's nice about what I need from you is um, the format sort of encourages us not to explain our decision-making criteria, but just be very clear and unambiguous about our responses. And then these representatives would again, trade responses and take those back to the group and ideally, you'd do some form of debrief. You'd describe, hey, you know, this is what we asked for, and this is our response. What, what are the implications of this? Is there some, you know, what are we going to do with this information? Oh, yay, all of our dreams can come true. You know, then we can start planning additional action. Um, or we, can, we need to send a liaison to make these things happen, right? How, how are we going to receive these resources? Um, or on the flip side, ooh, you know, we... To this thing that we thought was make or break isn't going to happen. Can we even proceed? What makes sense now? Um, so yeah, that's the basic pattern of what I need from you. And in this instance, I mean, since you do sort of have these clearly defined user groups, I think it's a great strategy. As you describe this one as well, um, another thing that comes to my mind is social network webbing. Uh, social network webbing is a... Um, what I would call is it's one of the more organic, emergent, and messy structures, especially at scale. Social network webbing um, 
asks us to draw a network graph or a, a, a or the web of relationships to visualize it. So okay. place yourself on a map and draw your draw a connecting line with the people you interact with most. Um, you know, to, to literally visualize the network topology that is maybe these clearly defined groups or, or literally the physical, uh, the, the psycho spiritual physical relational network amongst a school or these, this network of schools, for example. And then after you've sort of visualized it, you just take a step back and go, okay, you know, what patterns do we notice emerge here? Who do we think should be talking to each other that isn't talking to each other? Right. Um, it, it's especially at scale, it creates a bit a very interesting artifact, which is then a tool that you can use for further conversations. For social network webbing, there's a what is it? I think some app is the name of the tool that I would highly encourage people to use. It's definitely much more polished and professional, but then it creates an artifact that you can you you genuinely will want to reuse because it's so visually appealing and um, and and sort of like fascinating to sort of crawl through. Whereas when I've done them previously on something like Miro, then I end up with something that's like so often so ugly that it's like mm. it's like almost horrifying. Um, but uh, social network webbing could also be a very interesting exercise given the, yeah. the nature of this challenge and people being in silos. I think, I think look at, looking at these two structures uh, and uh, in addition to 2510 and an eco cycle definitely gives me something that like, ah, oh, yeah, there's a really, really interesting participatory and also non-judgmental program that is like, hey, however you think things are, you know, look, there's probably some work to do, right? I don't need to say, oh, it's shit and shove that perspective down your throat. We got to do something different. But I definitely give you very organic, very, um, very, uh, tools at scale to um, create artifacts of discussion and to really talk about, really get information on the table that, that may be needed. So see, seeing as we've been working on this thing and I've got to go pick up my daughter soon, yeah. why don't you jump back into the mix and tell us what you might take away from this conversation. And maybe that problem of me turning off your video is now uh, salient. We're back into. <laughs> I can talk, but I can't be seen. <laughs> Hold on, let me ask to start video. That'll give you a prompt. I'm trying, okay. but I'm saying that you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. <laughs> now, <back> again. <laughs> well, you know. The yeah. thing is, thank you very much for engaging with a, such a nebulous an abstract problem. I kind of have the, um, what you always learn from these experiences is what's been said and what hasn't been said. And what's obvious to one person is not obvious to everyone. Hmm. So that's a good point about communicating. And in fact, one of the things about what I need from you is one of the main purposes it has served for me is to say, can you ask a question that can be answered? You know, and and so I think that that is a particularly useful exercise. I've usually found it useful when everyone agreed on what we're trying to do, and then we're saying, "What do I need from you in order for us to succeed together?" So I I like the idea of that conversation cafe. I think imp I think impromptu networking and conversation cafe work well. You make an intimate connection that's trusting, and then the conversation cafe can bring out the the topics that need to be talked about. And I think the idea of framing things as a problem to be solved as opposed to an opportunity to be realized is one, one interesting issue in me setting up the story of what I'm trying to do. So like having an open mind about how to construct that and making it easy for people to volunteer for something positive or something critical but I didn't talk about symptoms or, you know, actual things that people are, are in general agreement that there's anxiety about or worry about that. And I don't know how to get that into the story in a way that's constructive. So if I say, you know, 
surveys indicate that there's an issue about emotional well-being or enrollments are going down or any kind of you know e EKG type of statistic that is something that might worry people or some opportunity in a given market where there's an opportunity for something to happen because of um, other schools closing down or there being some sort of global event that is important in that context. So discovery action dialogue, I'm quite interested in. I don't know a lot about that, but what I think is good in that is getting people to, and I, and I feel like those, those three, impromptu networking, conversation cafe, and the dad help to articulate what the problem is because if we don't let that come from the bottom of the organization and the community, it's not going to come from the top because there's a vested interest in having things be like they are. There's a certain amount of complacency unless there's a crisis. So you're going to have a better chance of realizing an opportunity when you're listening to the community's perception. So getting the community out from under the hierarchy so that they can speak with the, with the true voice is a, a goal of the organization of activities like this. Uh, find the volunteers. Who wants to do this? Why do you? Why do I think that I know what the problem is? Those are those are all good feedback. I, you know, I I think that I do the echo cycle, and I'm asking myself which things are in the poverty trap, and which things are in the rigidity trap. Which things are we doing out of habit, and we've kind of forgotten why we're doing them. Mm. But whatever question, I think that's really, you know, something to think about. It's just, whatever means, I don't know what you're talking about. So I was really getting that from the group at the beginning of the conversation, like whatever, you haven't told us en enough to work with, but you gradually did get enough to work with because you tried to imagine it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Social network webbing, I don't know anything about. 2510, I've used a bit. My actual biggest challenge is gonna be to get people to devote 45 minutes or an hour to having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I need to figure that, that's the nut that I need to figure out. Whichever of the structures that I apply to the situation, I think it can be fun. It can be trust building and positive and generate enthusiasm for potential. And I don't feel in any way negative or despairing about the situation. I just feel an opportunity at the end of the pandemic if there ever is an end to the pandemic. But I feel like there's an opportunity to reinvent normal and we should try to take that. Mm. And I want, and the last thing I was gonna say is getting to a question that can be answered, maybe also nobody really talked about students. And I feel like students are the richest source that I have because they don't remember what it was like. You know, the youngest ones don't remember what it was like before the people were wearing masks. Mm. And the, they don't have a sense of sadness one of the things that I've noticed in looking at mental well-being and surveys is that the older the students, the more feeling of depression and sadness there is. Mm -hmm. And it's because they had expectations that aren't being met. They don't get to go to, to you know, Nepal or they don't get to go to China or they don't have their prom or the things that they were expecting to do as a group, go to Scotland for the weekend and get crazy. They're not getting to do that stuff and they feel sad about it. And you can look at the grades of students and it, happiness goes you know, up as it goes down as your grade gets higher. And I think to some extent, maybe adults are you know, also living that, that same reality. Mm. So that's a place where I feel like, okay, there's an opportunity there for people to say what they need. So if you're right about uh, what I need from you, the, 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 the opportunity is to be happy you know, to discover that again in a way that resembles the happiness we thought we knew before. So I'll just close by saying thank you. That's, <laughs> it's kind of fearsome and scary to sit there and realize how opaque the description that I've given you appears to be. And then, and then it's like, what's, the, what's to lose is learning that, you know? So it can be painful, but it's still worth it. Yeah. yeah, I would really, yep, yep, yep. 
Um, well, I'm curious, David, as you continue to go and explore, right, at some point. Yeah, so the most important thing out of what you just said for me is like, is this question of invitation, right? That's what really jumps out. It's like, how can you craft like the most rock solid invitation that speaks to aspiration and desire and gets people to want to engage in the process, right? And then from there, like, I think everything's sort of rosy. There's, there's the beginnings of something pretty awesome. So thanks for bringing us a big, hairy, like yeah. wildly ambitious, like normally we've been, we've been talking about like, just like, oh, I got a meeting where we're going to do this. And this is where we, here we really wrestled with something that is sort of Leviathan in scale. So awesome. Um, hopefully you, hey, on a scale of one to five, how, how have everybody in terms of participants been, has this been a good use of time? Or one being like low, five being, yes, life affirmative. I learned something new. Just in th use your fingers in three, two, one. Let me see them. Oh, bang. Awesome, guys. Well, this has been the, the Wise Crowds Liberating Structures design call. Um, there's a whole bunch of links. Um, in the doc is that link to the 2510 tool program by David Heath. Um, so check it out and see if you can make use of that for your remote working uh, lives. Um, I thank you guys very much for your time, attention, and energy. I got to go pick up my daughter, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys at the next one next week. Thank you for organizing and for facilitating and all your input. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for bringing it out. Yeah. Bye bye. Well, my name is Jeremy Akers, Jeremy Nathaniel Akers. This has been a thing, and uh, thanks for hanging out. Gushes.